All right. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Welcome to our event on open social science and public engagement. Um, as I mentioned, it was organized by the New York City chapter of the Scholar Strategy Network. Scholar Strategy Network connects scholars to policymakers, civic leaders, the media, the public. Um, and we put on trainings and workshops for researchers to increase the reach and the impact of our scholarly work. This is one such workshop, welcome. Um, SSN is organized into chapters. Um, there, I think there are like 37, 38 chapters across the US. Um, if you're not a member, if you're interested, you can apply on our website. I'll put it in the chat again. Um, our event today is gonna help us understand how and why we wanna participate in the movement for open science. How can we better communicate our research among the scholarly community, but also engage with the public audience? We are so excited to have with us Dr. Philip Cohen, who is a professor of sociology and a demographer at the University of Maryland College Park. He's the founding director of Social Archive, an open archive of the social sciences, and generally an advocate for open science in the research community. Dr. Cohen has a long and brilliant CV of publications, primarily about family and inequality, and a popular textbook some of you will know uh, called The Family, Diversity, and Equality, and Social Change. And some of you may also remember Dr. Cohen's law lawsuit against Trump for blocking him on Twitter. Um, wanted to make sure to mention that. Uh, and with this short introduction, I'll turn it over to Dr. Cohen. Uh, thank you very much, Sophia, and um, and the SSN um, chapter, New York City chapter, for inviting me. Um, it's great to have uh, um, to have the chance to come talk, and also nice to have a local a local chapter, but uh, but an audience from from anywhere. So um, so that's great. Uh, I, I'm going to um, I'll start sharing slides, and so I won't be able to see probably your chats or hands raised. Um, uh, we're scheduled for 90 minutes. I'm going to um, stop before the top of the hour, um, and we'll we'll take um, questions and discussion. So if you have um, if you have questions as we go, it's fine with me if you shout them out um, if they're clarifying or whatever. Or but if you put them in the chat, I might not see them. Uh, but I'll do my best and I'll leave time at the end because uh, I know people ha might have practical, technical, political, any kind of questions um, and it's hard to anticipate. So I'll just try to make sure I leave time. Okay, uh, let's share this. How's that? Shared? Good, thanks. Okay, um, uh, so that's me. I'm Philip Cohen. I'm a, a sociologist at the University of Maryland. There's my contacts. Um, Social Archive is a um, an archive that I um, uh, direct. It is um, uh, now um, run out of the University of Maryland libraries, which means I serve at the pleasure of the dean of the libraries, basically, um, and that means they pay for it, um, which is um, not that much. But um, but I mean, not to diminish their contribution, but um, it's a it's a low budget operation, and I'll talk more about that. Um, so uh, <clears throat> if you're here, you're probably somewhere in this category, uh, people who are um, uh, who want to have some influence with your work as a social scientist on policy and politics or on other social scientists or the public um, uh, uh, in a context of enrollment crisis, budget problems, the, um, the crisis in democracy um, represented by that icon, um, et cetera. So that, that's what we're trying to handle. And my basic pitch on it is um, that the, 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 the way for us as scholars um, to, to, um, to address these goals that we have is to combine um, being public in our intellectual life and intellectual in our public life. Um, and so, um, uh, um, it, I, I am looking for ways to integrate these two aspects um, in ways that strengthen them both. So that's kind of my overarching mission in, in this work and in a talk like this. Um, from the um, point of view of social science, open science, um, um, we have to have um, we have to have a level of accountability in all of the communication that we do. 
Um, and the key tool or principle in for accountability from of science and social science is openness. Um, and I'll talk about the sort of the parameters of that um, a little bit. It doesn't mean everything is always open to everybody, but openness is a key aspect of our um, of our accountability and the trust that we ask people to put uh, in us. I have a few um, just contextualizing um, uh, slides on some of the challenges that we face. Um, uh, our, our, our work takes a long time to come out. Um, this is the average um, um, time from submission to publication in uh, um, the journals of the American Sociological Association. So from 20 months, um, uh, I, and I ballpark this by the first round review time plus one revision review time plus the production lag. Um, if you take time in between to do the revisions, you have to add that time here. <laughs> this assumes your revision is ready right away. So 20 months from soci sociological theory um, uh, uh, at the slowest and um, around um, seven months uh, at ASR, social ed or social psychology quarterly and socius of course is faster, but an average of nine months. So it's taking a long time um, in the pace of the discourse to get our work out in peer reviewed journals. Um, when it does come out in peer reviewed journals, we have the paywall problem, that is who can see the work. Um, and that's not so, um, that's, a, that's an economic problem, um, but, and it's also a problem of, of it just increasing friction. It's just slowing everything down so that when we share our work, not everybody can read it, then we're sharing PDFs, then we're getting temporary logins and, or we're paying extra to have an open access version, et cetera. You're familiar with this probably. Um, that's probably partly why you're here. Um, and oh, when sorry, it, can yes. I jump in for a second? Do you mind changing your slides to where we just see the slide and not the preview so that it's easier to see oh. for us? Oh, you're see okay, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. That. No, no, that's okay. I thought I had done that already. So let me um let me reshare. Um, you're not supposed to see the preview. That's totally wrong. Yeah, we saw the preview, but it's all mostly uh, about the size. <laughs> Uh, mm -mm. is that better? Yes. Or is that the same? Oh, that's Thank you better? so much. Yes. Okay, good. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, I can go back and edit in the, the introduction again for the, for the recorded version. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> so the paywall is a big problem of, um, Introducing friction, slowing everything down, and and uh, reducing equity and access. Um, the the um, the potential for changing this system is um, uh, impeded by the monopoly conditions that we're working under. Um, these are just the five thousand most recent sociological sociology articles. Last time I checked, um, eighty percent of them are from these five publishers in sociology. Sage is the is the behemoth. Um, our association, the American Sociological Association, is pretty well captured by SAGE um, and organizationally not interested in changing this um, beyond what might be necessary for um, sort of um, tinkering daily functions and PR. Um, so, so we have a problem of um, trying to get structural change through um, under monopoly conditions, which some of you probably know much more about than I do. Um, so, um, with that context, we have the uh, we have the intervention of preprints, um, or as you'll see when we talk about social archive papers. Um, but preprints is the category um, in the scholarly communication system that um, uh, uh, the reference term that people use, and this is a way basically to um, address a lot of the problems that we have um, without solving them, or that is to work around the problems that we have um, in a way that uh, improves our work. Um, without having to wait for the system to be restructured. So um, uh, here are um, some of the major preprint servers. Um, Archive is where it started. That's mostly math and physics. It was mostly math and, math and physics. Now has a lot of other fields, especially computer science. Um, uh, BioArchive came along um, after that. The, the X here is really a chi, it's Greek, and that's why we're saying chive. Um, BioArchive and then um, Social Archive and Site Archive came around 2016, uh, um, um, uh, and so that's that's how long we've been in this business. So preprints are, um, um, they're finished drafts, but they're not peer reviewed. Um, uh, the papers on Social Archive are not all preprints. Some of them are 
free versions or accepted versions of peer reviewed papers. So some of them are not, don't fit the definition of preprint used by everybody. So I'll explain some of that technical uh, uh, bit as we go. But, uh, but um, um, a preprint is like what we would call in, so in social science, uh, historically, a working paper. Um, it's a formal scholarly output. It's permanent and citable. Um, uh, and um, it, 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 it's a research event when it's published. It happens um, like publication in a journal and uh, becomes part of the record. Um, why are we doing this? Um, um, this will be a recurring theme, but I'll outline a couple of, uh, couple of three reasons, efficiency, engagement, and inclusivity. Um, uh, you've all probably experienced the frustration of uh, doing work that you're excited by, that you think is excellent. Maybe you presented at a conference and gotten good feedback, and then it enters into this doldrums period where you're just waiting. Um, and and the frustrating thing about that is you're waiting for people who are who's having who are having their arms twisted to read it, while you suspect or you hope that there are people actually out there who want to read it and they have to wait. Okay, so so time is a key element. Um, uh, for access, um, we just it it goes against it it goes against our um, our principles to have our work. Um, not accessible to so many people that we think it might matter to. Um, so it's a it's a matter of um, uh, efficiency, but it's also a matter of um, uh, of principle that it should be available to more people. And partly that may be because the public supports our work uh, in terms of grants or our salaries, and partly because we just want um, we we're not we're, we don't aspire to have our work hidden from the people it most affects. <clears throat> and then. Um, a key element is also the connection among scholars and social scientists. Um, those things that are that slow down our work, that uh, that put up barriers of access, um, are really also um, a drag on our ability to connect with other scholars. And and the engagement process that we seek is not just about sort of broadcasting our work to the public, but also about building collaborative. Um, um, spaces with uh, with other scholars, and so um, reducing that. Um, um, those barriers or that friction is key to that. So preprints have um, exploded in the last uh, 20 some years. Um, these are the major uh, preprint servers. Um, uh, I added Search Archive and SciArchive, uh, and you can also see how small they are um, in the grand scheme, but we're up um, uh, approaching 400,000 preprints per year. Um, uh, you can see Archive is still the biggest uh, of them. Um, um, the, e the EPMC is the European um, uh, um, is the European agency that is collecting this data. So those are other things in their database. Um, so just to show you the wave that we're riding, um, and in terms of um, putting that wave in the context of um, the overall scholarly output, one way to do it is just to compare that number to the total number of articles appearing in Web of Science um, in all fields. Um, each year, and um, and what this is showing is that um, the number of preprints each year is about fourteen percent of the number of articles in Web of Science um, uh, each year. So the um, uh, it doesn't mean that every one of these papers, you know, the the denominator is a little bit messed up, but it's just to show you the relative size. Um, so increasing rapidly and becoming a large part of the research landscape. Um, we've seen this, I'll give some examples from the pandemic, because we've seen during the pandemic um, um, a, a rise in both productivity and visibility of preprints, especially in the medical health and life sciences uh, field. So I'll give a few examples from that, even though those, that's not what most of us work in. Um, this was um, from a, a paper by Fraser et al. Um, that showed um, the preprint and journal article production on COVID-19 related topics in the first 10 months, just in 2020 of the pandemic. And um, uh, uh, the point of this was that there was um, uh, that a large fraction of the rapid of the rapidly produced research came out in the form of preprints, mostly on med archive um, and bio archive. Um, but also, um, you can see the other ones that are included there um, in the chart. Um, uh, one of the things that this paper did, which was interesting, was that they followed some of these papers um, to see um, how what they looked like when they were published um, in journals and um, very often published with um, hardly any substantive change or no change in the main findings. 
Um, and so that was in a way reassuring that it implied the preprint system was accelerating the distribution of research without um, um, producing tons of junk that was not, um, that was wrong. Um, however, of course, some of it is wrong. And so we can talk about that too. Um, um, some some peer-reviewed work is wrong. Some preprints are wrong. Um, probably more preprints than peer-reviewed papers are wrong. Um, um, so um, it's something something that we can discuss and think about. Um, but um, our um, our system adapted um, more rapidly than, um, or that is, the whole ecosystem adapted more rapidly than the journal publishing system did. So Med Archive um, really exploded in starting in 2020. They have this um, caution on there that says these are preliminary reports have not been certified. Um, so you, you shouldn't report them in the news media as established information. However, they were reported in the news a lot. So is that bad? Um, um, well, um, yes and no. Um, I think mostly not because the, the there was also great journalism happening and the journalism, um, the, the good journalists out there were um, using other indicators of reliability for the work. Um, who are the researchers? They would interview other experts. Um, uh, you would see an article in the New York Times or the Washington Post about some preprint with um, three top experts interviewed. Um, and that's essentially what we get out of peer review, but in, in the space, space of a few hours. Um, journalists are also um, science reporters and um, Many journalists are also um, have skills and training themselves. They do some own some of their own assessment, and um, they assess whether things are newsworthy as well as um, whether they are reliable. So the system is not perfect, but the system um, um, worked around the slowness of the journals. Some of the big stories of the pandemic, you may remember, these came from preprints. As death soared um, um, uh, uh, far more than um, uh, uh, the excess deaths were more than we were counting from the um, the official count. That was an early an early paper appeared in Med Archive, then um, uh, published in the Washington Post, and it introduced to a lot of people the concept of ex excess mortality and the problems of um, attributing cause of death during the pandemic. Um, another example of an early um, preprint that made a lot of news. Um, the, uh, the, the, the result that um, the delaying lockdowns cost lives. So comparing places that locked down early versus those that didn't um, with echoes of the um, uh, 1918 influenza pandemic. Um, uh, uh, this also a preprint, um, it was later, as in like six months later, published in a journal, um, updated somewhat, but the main finding held up um, even when it was published you know, published later in a, in a prestigious journal, but it was in the news immediately. And it was um, because the reporters um, did the work. Um, another example from um, closer to my work, um, housework in the pandemic and so on. So these things were reported widely. Um, <clears throat> and what is this doing to our, to our process? And do we like it or not like it? And should we do this ourselves? And so um, that's a little preamble. I'll talk a little bit about sort of the theory of of publishing um, and where uh, where preprints um, come into that. Okay, this slide from ASAP Bio, um, the nonprofit that was involved in the creation of BioArchive and very active in the uh, preprint area. Um, okay, so what we normally do normally in the in in the um, what I would call the legacy publishing process, um, journals, you write your manuscript um, and you submit it to a journal and then you wait. Um, um, uh, uh, then it's rejected, just say, maybe rejected. You send it to another journal, R&R, revise, wait, um, uh, uh, revise, journal number three, okay, check, 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 those are the peer reviews, finally accepted. So months or years later, you have a peer reviewed paper, okay? Um, this process may be great for um, uh, improving the work, making sure, you know, that you can really, that it's reliable and so on. So this, this, you know, in theory, there's nothing wrong with having lots of time and energy directed to peer review. Peer review is great. The point at which we publish it now in this process is when we establish things in the scholarly record, like the, in the, um, the record that this work was done by these people at this time, sort of establishing precedents. Whose idea was it? And um, uh, what was the innovation? What's the contribution? And sort of time stamping it. That's one of the functions of journals that happens after all this, um, after this whole process 
goes on. We also have the sort of the promotion or public um, function that journals play, which is saying, you know, sort of announcing it, promoting it, sharing it with people, sending it to libraries, sort of getting it in front of a lot of readers. And with the, um, with the information attached to it that it has been peer reviewed, that some experts think it's, um, think it's good. Okay, but the issue here is that the months and years that it took to get to that point, when um, um, we could, we can break this up a little. Uh, fi finally, a journal has chosen it for selection of this journal, so this journal wants to share it. Okay, all of that happens um, after the after the months and years. In the preprint um, a workflow, the difference is that. Um, that manuscript sort of at the point it's ready to go to the journal or whenever it's sort of complete, you have a complete draft that you're ready to share, it instead goes into a very basic screening process, not a peer review assessment of quality. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I can talk about the moderation process at Social Archive, it's very light. Basically, is it research? Um, uh, is, it, is it written by who, who um, the authors say they are and so on? Um, and then it's public. Okay, so what does that do? It, we still have the same functions that we need to do in the scholarly record. Um, it's time stamping, it's establishing precedents for the idea and the findings. These people did this at this time. It's also promoting the idea, bringing it before a wider audience and saying, here, we did this, please read this. And it's delaying the later functions. Some experts have read it and think it's okay, that's peer review, and the journal selecting it saying, we think it's important. So it's, 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 um, it's separating the functions of, of what journals now do and taking part of what um, part of what journals now do and moving it earlier in the process. Okay. Um, now, in theory, when this happens, that um, that later work can be of higher quality um, if all that um, feedback and deliberation somehow gets back into the journal workflow. But even if it doesn't, it's still um, moving these aspects of the process earlier in time. Okay. Um, so what about peer review? And one concern that a lot of people have about preprints is they might be bad, they might be wrong. Um, is, it, is, it, is it problematic to do this? Does, what happens to our trust? Our, um, uh, either you know, can we trust it or are we, are we sacrificing our public trust by distributing work that's not yet peer reviewed? Well, um, I think it's worth pausing to look at the whole research life cycle when we ask this question. And this is a diagram that the Center for Open Science, which is the nonprofit that hosts, that runs the platform that Social Archive is hosted on, um, uh, that they use. And you can sort of see the familiar um, outlines of the research process. You, you read the literature, you develop an idea, you design, collect data, analyze, publish, and then that publication goes back into the process. Okay, but this process includes a lot of opportunities for evaluation. And the journal peer review is just one, just one moment in that. Um, um, the work can be evaluated at different stages, and it is um, in, a, in a couple of key ways. Um, funding agencies, conferences, um, uh, um, not, in addition to journals, um, other, other people uh, or institutions that are evaluating the work as it goes, um, and then also the individuals themselves. You know, if you have a job, if you have tenure, if you're a graduate student, someone has already decided, um, uh, your status has already been adjudicated to some degree. Um, and so uh, you don't, you don't wanna um, rest everything on that. You don't wanna assume that um, someone from one school's work is better than another school or anything like that, but we do carry a reputation which, in, which in, contains within it um, some assessment of our um, veracity as a scholar. So there, there are other ways besides just the article being reviewed. Okay, so that's, um, um, that's just a, a, a comment on the principle of peer review, which is vitally important, but doesn't just happen at that one moment. When we look at this um, research life cycle, there are, uh, um, you know, I'm giving this talk about preprints and social archive and where to put papers, but, you know, this is part of an, of an overall movement toward open science, which includes you know, many moments or opportunities for, um, for um, the principles of open science to work. And so I just wanted to highlight where we are in that, where we in this talk are in that wider process. Um, study pre-registration um, is when um, the, your, uh, the research design is peer reviewed or uh, potentially reviewed or at least time stamped before the data is collected. Um, uh, uh, the uh, materials and 
methods, the code and data um, are shared in, 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 in many ways. There's a new um, report out um, yesterday that NIH is gonna start requiring um, um, a data management, a data dissemination plan in their grants starting next year. So there, there are a number of places where this happens and in the publication process, just one. So I want to highlight that. Okay. Um, so Sarsh Archive, well, it's hard to make a graph that looks like this very exciting. It's just a line going up. Um, so I put that big explosion on the end. Um, we just hit 10,000 papers um, uh, since, uh, since 2016. This count starts in 2017. It's harder than it looks to count these papers. But anyway, um, uh, um, uh, this is where we are. Very small in the grand scheme of preprints with you know, 400,000 per year <clears throat> or up to 10,000 altogether. Um, uh, but uh, the, but for any one of you who's considering submitting your work, this doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that you're putting your work, um, that that you're um, uh, that you're disseminating your work um, according to the kind of principles that I'm talking about. So let's let's talk about what those are. Okay, um, here's a preprint on Social Archive, a paper. Sorry, on Social Archive, it was a preprint. It's not anymore. Um, this is one of mine. Um, uh, and uh, it's called The Coming Divorce Decline. You can see that what you're looking at is actually the Socius version. It was published in the open access journal Socius. Um, um, so I'm free to distribute this copy of it however I like. Um, so so what, do we, um, what, do we, what do we get here? Um, Social Archive is giving us a download count, the number of times the paper has been downloaded from this site. Um, it has this annotation function um, where um, if you if you click on those uh, buttons, you can add comments, um, you know, in text comments or general comments, re reactions to the paper. Um, we have this plotted uh, endorsement tool, which is sort of like um, mobile or individual peer review. Anybody with an ORCID ID can endorse any work they want to. Um, by clicking on this button, and you can organize that. You can, you know, you can mobilize people to review things um, that are just papers sitting on Social Archive. Um, Social Archive um, uh, is on the Open Science Framework, which is the platform of the Center for Open Science. Um, and so every paper that you put up, you have the opportunity to put up um, um, an endless um, supply of uh, supplemental materials, data and code and other figures and all your appendices and all that. So um, that's an option that you have. Um, the digital object identifier, the DOI, um, there are two in this case. One is the one that Social Archive gave this paper when I posted it. And then when the paper was subsequently published in Socius, I added this peer review publication DOI. Um, and these two DOIs are now being together um, means, although there was a lag between them, that means that on um, Google Scholar, for example, um, if somebody cited the working paper version, um, those citations will be counted together with the journal version. So um, the, um, the, this putting these together um, in the, you know, in the behind the scenes that's linking these two papers. Um, we have a variety of license options. Um, um, you can do uh, uh, Creative Commons, non-commercial, non-derivative, uh, et cetera, um, depending on how you wanna license the paper that you post, or if you put no license, um, uh, you're, uh, you're still, in all these cases, you still have the copyright. If you put no license, it's just whatever it says on the paper determines um, who can share it and when. We can talk more about that if there are questions. We do some simple taxonomy. We leave this up to the authors, the moderators. When you upload your paper, just make just look at it to see if it seems um, plausible. We don't do a lot of enforcement on these, um, but um, we have categories um, uh, that are um, uh, from drop-down menus. Um, in the sociology um, section, we use the names of the ASA sections. Um, in the other um, areas, we support all of social sciences, also education and law and arts and humanities. We're very broad. Um, uh, and then there's the versioning. Um, and this is very important for the um, for continuity in the scholarly record and for um, so that you're not serving up broken links to different versions, to different places on the internet. You can see this is actually version five, uh, um, and you can look at the old versions there. Um, the, the, anybody who comes to this page is always going to see the last version first. The vast majority won't care about earlier versions, um, but they're they're under there. Um, if you if you clicked on that and looked, you would see the very first version I submitted. Uh, uh, in 2018, and then subsequently the later versions all the way up to this version 
um, published in Socius, I could upload a, a, a later version still, the data on divorce in the American Community Survey comes out every year. Okay, so that's sort of the architecture, the anatomy of a, of a, of a paper on social archive. <coughs> um, I wanna give it one other example, and this is from CUNY, um, of a way that people use social archive. Um, we have long had in social science um, a working paper series where an institution like the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality or lots of other things you probably are familiar with NBER working papers. The working paper series is a, um, a cherished institution in social sciences um, and uh, uh, often has involved papers that are distributed in working paper format from before the internet um, and then subsequently revised or not revised and published in journals later. Now that we have this technology, um, we can do a better job of, um, of, of making this process work and be um, uh, uh, provide a consistent um, uh, contribution to the, the scholarly record. Let me just give you this example. Um, the Stone Center has this working paper series. Here's one of their papers um, uh, by Milanovic after the financial crisis. Um, um, when you click on that link, um, it will take you to this page um, that is still on their site. So they put this up um, um, on July 2020. This paper was posted as a working paper. You can see they've now added a link to the published version, which was only uh, 11, 10 months later, which is impressive, um, in the review of income and wealth. So um, uh, what happened was in July 2020, they post this paper on social archive, um, but they maintain a list of them. So they're sort of, they're using us as a platform to distribute their papers. This is what it looked like um, uh, when they, this is what it looks like today um, on social archive. You can see they put it up um, uh, uh, July 2020. Um, it's been downloaded uh, about 800 times on social archive um, under this, this version is under this creative commons um, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So anybody can read and share this version, um, but the journal version is still, um, uh, is now the, um, the latest version. They, they, don't, they didn't put the journal version up here. They probably don't have the permission to, um, to share the journal PDF. Um, but um, this shows you that during that time between um, July and May, um, they, they got it out, they did, they, you know, hundreds of people downloaded the paper and it went on to be published. And this still serves as a free version um, that people can read. Okay. Um, why, why not? What are the, what are, uh, uh, people are concerned. It's a new thing for people. Um, not everything, um, not everybody wants to do this for every paper at all times. So I'll talk a little bit about sort of the issues. Um, um, some people are worried that um, a, a paper they have written is not good enough to share publicly. Um, and it may not be, so that's an important question. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so a question is, um, uh, how do we handle being wrong? Um, uh, and, and what are the consequences of that? Um, and also, um, <clears throat> there's also just sort of the, the managing your own dignity and respect and work um, and trying to decide whether or not you think it's good enough. Um, so um, a lot of people think it's not good enough. Um, uh, or they think um, they need to have peer review before they um, have sort of feel um, permitted to share their work. Um, um, if you look at the difference between peer reviewed work and uh, initial drafts, usually um, uh, this concern is not borne out, but, um, but that's for you to, um, for you to consider. Um, I, I, usually, I think more people err on the side of being too cautious. That's my personal view. Okay. Um, a lot of people are afraid if they post a preprint, they won't be able to publish it in a journal later. Um, this is um, a, a vanishing problem. Um, uh, most journals, all the ASA journals, um, uh, almost all journals in social science um, allow you to um, submit papers to their journal after they have already been shared online. Um, if they won't do that, then they're really, their interest is really not the public interest and you should publish in another journal. But you know, people feel compelled to publish in certain journals. You can look up the policies for any journal conveniently on this database uh, or click around on the website of the journal. Um, but all the journals run by the giant publishers have policies on this now, default policies. So, so it's very rarely a problem um, that, you won't, uh, that you won't be able to publish it in a journal. Um, this one is, um, is interesting. People are afraid their ideas will be stolen if they publish, if they publish them as preprints. Um, 
uh, that I think this is mostly backwards, that mostly the, the, um, you're protecting yourself by posting it as a preprint. You're posting it publicly. You're getting a timestamp. You can share it widely. You get a DOI for the paper. Um, and if somebody steals your idea, then it's just like stealing. It's just as if they stole it from a published a journal, a, a paper published in a journal. They're just stealing an idea. Um, and you have the receipts in the form of your, um, your preprint. Um, I should add, excuse me, I should add, I think the problem of stealing ideas probably happens more in people's inner circles, especially their mentors and advisors and committee members and journal peer reviewers. And those, the people who are stealing ideas are usually not getting them from the public from the public square. They have some private access to your ideas and they're, um, and they're um, uh, abusing that position of trust. So in a case like that also, posting it publicly um, can really, can help you. Okay. Um, so when should you share it? If you're gonna share a paper, if you're gonna post a preprint, what is the time to do it? Well, Search Archive is very flexible. The other preprint servers are less so. Um, um, uh, but we are, um, we're very agnostic, very open um, as far as you can, you can post a paper in any stage. So if you're, um, if you're feeling confident about it or you want to get, get it going, you can post a paper as soon as you want some feedback. Or if you want to find some collaborators and get, um, get some attention and bring it to the attention of, a, of, a, of a people in your network. Um, if you're a little bit more cautious, a little bit um, more cautious, you can um, wait until you're submitting it to a conference. Um, then you're already preparing to show it to um, to some strangers, some professionals, some experts, um, uh, but not completely. Um, uh, uh, but but um, but not waiting for it to be already peer reviewed. Um, if you're more confident still, I mean less confident still, you could wait until you're really ready to show it. Um, the time at which you're sending to a journal, you're ready, you're ready to have it be formally evaluated. Um, then you can just widen the circle and have it be evaluated by more people. If you're most cautious, you can wait until it's already accepted. Um, and then, you're, then you can say, I'm sharing this preprint. Um, uh, you see this all the time on social media. I'm so happy I got my paper accepted. Um, in, in a few months, I'll share it with you. Um, or send me an email and I'll share it with you, which people, um, people think that's a friendly and nice thing to say, but it actually creates a lot of, um, uh, uh, you get a lot less readers than if you just um, put up a link, if you ask people to send you an email. So the point at which it's peer reviewed and accepted, there's really no reason to wait anymore. Um, uh, it's been validated. It's already ready to, for the public. Now you're just waiting for the journal. So you may as well just do it. Or at the very least, the very, very least, you can wait until it's literally published and then just use Social Archive to share a free version um, um, at, at the very end. Okay. Um, our general, um, um, I, I want to situate this um, question of preprints and posting papers on Social Archive in the context of open research, open science in general. Uh, I'll make this um, general pitch that science, as you know, is an iterative process. It involves a lot of people. Um, they all benefit from um, a collaborative um, environment where everybody um, uh, has access to the published record. That's how science works. Um, and um, uh, uh, there, there's an openness um, implied in the way that science works in the publication process. It's just that um, uh, uh, it hasn't kept up with the technology. Um, I do not mean to imply here that everything must be shared um, with everyone at all times. Um, there are times you do sometimes need to keep things private. Um, sometimes you want to co um, communicate just with your specific collaborators, et cetera. Um, sometimes you have, um, you know, um, preliminary results that you're really um, um, not sure about and you don't want to share with outside of a circle. Um, that's totally fine. It's just a question about being um, purposive um, uh, in how you do this. Um, uh, sharing papers is part of this whole research lifestyle, uh, life cycle approach that I uh, mentioned. Um, uh, the question is, how can we build our workflows uh, around um, tools and practices that will maximize um, the kind of sharing that we want um, without um, creating huge burdens on us, either administrative burdens or issues of privacy and confidentiality and so on. There's a lot of questions. We need to build tools to make it um, 
to um, to uh, increase to reduce um, friction is my word of the day to reduce friction to make it um, to make it easier and faster um, to get better results. Um, uh, a general sort of um, principle in doing this is to try to, um, without changing your whole workflow, um, find a way to um, essentially. Um, you know, you have you have folders where all your work is. If you can sort of check a box when you're ready to share a particular element, um, that's what I mean by modular approach with a sharing layer. So you're working, you're working, you're working, and when you're ready, when you get to a certain point, you can say, okay, this piece is ready to share in this stage. Um, I, I do this just with folders where some folders are shared and some aren't, um, and I just um, I work I work out of the. I work out of the unshared folders and I drop things in the shared folders whenever I think they're ready. Um, um, so, uh, you know, the way I, the way I have that set up, it doesn't, it's doesn't, it's not a whole long process. It's literally just copying a file or dropping a file in a folder. Um, um, this establishes again, that timestamp, the precedence, I did this at this time. Um, uh, it enables people to, um, to get on and look at the work without going through um, a whole process of, you know, discussing, is it okay if I look, is this the version, is that the version? I thought you fixed it, is it all that? Um, uh, and then um, uh, sort of increasing everybody's efficiency. Okay, that's the idea. Um, um, in, in making our choices about this workflow, these workflow questions, um, infrastructure is a huge problem. I mean, it goes back to that problem of the monopolies that I discussed earlier. We don't build the tools that we're using by and large. Um, people love Google, um, people, uh, Google Drive, Google Scholar. Um, Google is not really your friend. Um, it's okay to use Google, you know, tools because they're awesome, um, but, um, you know, they won't love you back in the end. Excuse me. So uh, you can find the right tools for each part of your, um, each part of your workflow. Um, so the Open Science Framework is a great um, platform for sharing um, uh, research materials. Uh, and so that's what I use. Um, you know, if you use Zotero instead of one of the other citation management tools, it has a public um, sharing function. You put your papers on social archive. We want to support the, um, the development of the tools and infrastructure that are consistent with our values um, when all, uh, when, whenever possible. Okay. Uh, I think I have a couple more points to make about, um, uh, um, our sort of our overall approach. Ah, this is great. I love being home to do this. Uh, okay, who is our audience? You know, the old days, people used to mail papers to other people. I'm old enough to remember this. And you would write on it, you know, this is a draft, please don't quote or cite this without permission. Okay, you really can't do this anymore. People still do it, but you can't. Um, um, uh, the fact is, um, we're communicating with a lot of people um, uh, indirectly all the time. So I, we have to just try to get on top of this process instead of um, instead of instead of restricting it to something that we're more comfortable with. We have to learn how to work with it, and, and knowing that there will be that it will not be um, problem free. There will be problems, but they're usually not as bad as we're afraid they will be. Um, um, the audience is less the people that you're speaking to and now um, much more a network. It's the people that you are reaching right now and the people that they're reaching right now. Um, uh, and you don't know who they're gonna be. So you wanna, um, you wanna control your work and its dissemination um, within limits, but you also want it to be um, ready to be viewed by people that are outside of your immediate circle. Um, the people that we deal with are not the people that we used to deal with. There are journalists who really know about data, who, who do their own data analysis, sometimes with the same data. Um, there are people who, um, uh, uh, journalists who, uh, like I said before, Marshall peer review. Um, you may have gotten a call from journalists, I have a new paper I'm looking at, um, will you help me decide if it's okay, right? And then if you, know, you have an interview with that journalist, you may end up in their story, you may not. Um, that is not um, violating the principle of peer review, that's actually honoring the principle of peer review, if they do it well. Um, um, we are uh, increasingly uh, subject to what I would just call a chaotic disciplinary mashup. Um, uh, if an economist shares one of your papers and you're a sociologist, you may all of a sudden have a bunch of people reading it who you do not expect to read it. That can be great. Um, you wanna make sure it's not terrible. 
um, um, by uh, uh, taking whatever steps necessary in your in, to anticipate that, but it's usually not as bad as you think, even if it's terrible. Um, uh, uh, we do not get to choose whether we want to share things just with our friends um, and not with our enemies, for example. Um, not that, you know, enemies is a dramatic word, but you understand what I mean. Um, it's very hard to share something just with, a, with a, it, outside, of, outside of your immediate friends. It's very hard to share something and have it be completely insulated from going outside that. So we want to get on top of it instead of trying to restrict it, because that's a losing battle. And if we succeed, we don't really want to live in that world where so few people read our work. <coughs> I have uh, proposed this, um, this sort of way of thinking about all your stuff together. And I think this may be appropriate for something like the Scholar Strategy Network audience. Um, uh, uh, the different ways that you disseminate your work um, uh, are not just, I say disseminate, um, but uh, I, I want to come back to this. Um, dissemination is not, we don't want to just broadcast, we want to open communication. Um, peer review is vital for this, for our work in general. Um, it is a source of validation and legitimacy for us. However, it is not an efficient means of communicating. Right, it just is too slow. So um, uh, we want to do, um, we want to work around the slowness of that while still have the advantage of it, which is important. We want, and the principle of it is very important. Um, uh, the open science aspect, the open scholarship aspect of your work is very important, even if I don't. It's hard to, it's hard to empirically prove this, but I really, really believe it. So I'm interested in your thoughts on this. Even if people do not read your data and code and that validate everything you do, the fact that it's available says a lot. It says that you are open to being held accountable, that you are open to collaboration, that you're not trying to slow other people's work down, um, that you're not trying to own the work um, more than necessary just to do the work. So the openness, I think, is very important in this environment where there's um, a real challenge to trust uh, in, in social science and science in general. Um, and I think openness uh, is part of the accountability that we need to communicate in order to earn that trust. Um, and so I think it's important even if nobody ever um, uh, replicates your work. <clears throat> um, you, you combine this with a, um, a, an overall communication strategy. You've got your sort of home base, your website. We used to have a blog. Um, um, where um, that's completely under your control. It's the message and the image that you want to um, portray. Um, you communicate with about your own work and other people's work um, to widen the circle on social media. That brings you into connection with um, other friends and colleagues, people in other disciplines, journalists, et cetera. Uh, and then um, by it, when you have this whole package together, I think it helps you communicate with news media in a way that um, is more respectful of their time and energy. It's less um, simply trying to get them to report on a piece of scholarship you did right now, and more about building a relationship, more about helping them in the long run in ways that where you can help each other. Uh, it's about opening your, uh, signaling your own accountability, et cetera. So I, I, I call this pentagulation, I have no idea why, um, uh, but it just means um, that you have an overall strategy um, that has a, a lot of different access points. I do want to highlight this, um, the point I, I made about um, broadcasting. And I think it's a real, um, um, I think it's, it, it does us a disservice because it's not as good as it could be when we say we want to use social media, we want to use these various platforms to get our work out there. Um, we also want to get other people's work in here, and we want to hear from other people. And so um, social media, if used well, um, is just as much about listening as it is about speaking. Um, and, um, and, and the same goes for open science. Um, we, want to, we want to get our work out there, but we also want to make uh, uh, open up the possibilities of, of hearing from other people in constructive ways. Um, I saw a, um, a thread on uh, Twitter yesterday um, uh, that or the day before yesterday where somebody said, um, you know, that, that they had the, their work was anonymously peer reviewed and then they saw it plagiarized in a paper um, later. Um, well, that's terrible. But what if, um, if the, if the um, incentives were different and the communication structure was different, that person who stole your idea 
um, and put it in their paper. Um, if you had connected with them earlier in a more transparent um, uh, and collegial environment, you might have become collaborators. I mean, maybe that person is a terrible person, then it doesn't matter. But the point is, um, it's a shame when um, uh, the only in, 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 uh, exchange you have, the only opportunity to communicate you have with people is an anonymous peer review, and you don't get the opportunity to become collaborators, or if you do, it might be years later. Um, so uh, uh, we want to find ways to, um, to hear from other people as much as we want to find ways um, to make other people hear from us. Okay, so um, I have no idea. Um, I haven't seen your faces while I've been talking, so I don't know what questions um, you might have. So I'm going to stop um, and, um, and take questions that go in, in any direction that you have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Philip. Do you, do you want to stop sharing your screen? I do. And now I'm going to. Good. Thanks. Uh, wow. That, that, was, that was really useful. I feel very inspired. Glad, glad there are still some people here. <laughs> oh, yeah. We have a nice group and we have some hands up. So um, I'm happy to moderate. Let's see. Um, we, I see Heath. Go ahead. Uh, hi, that, that was terrific. I, I, I learned so much. I, I'm not a sociologist, um, but uh, I think everything that you, you shared about the discipline is you know, stretches to other social sciences, as, as you allude to frequently. So uh, I take all of these points uh, um, as really significant. The question I have is about audience. And what I know about how journalists learn to do their job and how editors learn to do their job um, is a pretty strict adherence to, if it's peer reviewed, we can reference it in the story. And if it's not, you know, the journalist is gonna get dinged by the editor. Um, the the editor is gonna say, but, you know, you know, but we've got this practice that we only reference peer reviewed. And, and it's, it's, it's a kind of a clear line. And students learn this in journalism school. I wonder if you could talk about how you have gone about trying to educate journalists and, and, and journalism schools about this changing uh, landscape of publishing, which, which will cause them to sort of either adjust or change or make this kind of futile. Um, so I want to even talk a little bit about that. I don't think it's true. I mean, I think what you're describing is not reality anymore. Um, there are, um, I'm sure there are still some editors who have that view. And I, I, I know they recognize the difference between peer reviewed and not. But if you just look at the news about research, it's a lot of it is about work that's not peer reviewed. In all the major publications, they report on research that's not peer reviewed all the time. Um, the question is how do they, what gives them the confidence in its veracity? Um, we might or might not be satisfied with the way that they do that, but they go by things like, does the person work at Harvard? Um, um, is it somebody that we have trusted in the past? Um, uh, do we have other experts that think it's reasonable? Um, if you look at the other things, the other research that um, the news media reports on, it's think tank reports, which are not peer reviewed. Um, it's their own data analysis. If you look at the, the explosion of journalistic data science in 538 and Box and uh, and the New York Times, they have data, they, they collect their own surveys, they analyze public, surveys, um, it's Pew, um, there, 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 there's tons of research reported which is not peer reviewed. I think that, um, uh, that, uh, that distinction is just being left behind um, and for better or worse, but I just don't think it's reality right now. I, I think that what you're, you're um, probably right about a small number of, of news outlets that have the capacity to do that. But my suspicion is that outside of the Vox and New York Times and data journalism, um, the, the old traditions, especially because your average journalist is under the age of 25 um, and has an editor under the age of 30 and is incredibly risk averse, um, outside of the people doing the data journalism, the people with um, that are at the um, a small number of institutes, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, Fox, of course. Um, but I think that there's a, would be a huge role to play of educating mm -hmm. outside of the, um, the, the, 
the elite outlets that have the capacity and training. And, and what you're talking about is people who are working right out of college, who have editors who don't have expertise and they're risk averse. And there's, a, I think, a massive opportunity for educating yes. those people in, in the exact ways that you're describing. So I think maybe both are true. And it's yeah. a huge chance, I think, uh, for um, you to, to spread. Thank you. Word. And it reminds me, I should share this. This is a journalist resource about um, reporting on preprints during the coronavirus that I found. Um, maybe you've seen it or maybe it's useful. Um, uh, I had looked at that a few months ago. Um, I do think that per the pandemic has changed this a lot. Um, uh, because uh, because people couldn't wait, um, so but uh, no, I, it, it's absolutely right. It's it's it's, it's definitely an issue, and um, uh, and it's also you know there is the, there's a there's a business interest in maintaining this distinction also because um, the publishers want you to um, want to reinforce this distinction all the time, um, and so um, so if you want their PR help, um, uh, uh, your university's um, uh, PR operation might might insist that things are peer reviewed uh, and so on. So um, it's not, I really, really, really am not against peer review or think it's, I don't want to diminish the importance of like, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, uh, um, and I agree it is um, something we really need to work on, but I think we're being helped in the environment right now by those leading um, journalism operations that you mentioned. Anyway. Thank you. Okay, okay. Some people are yeah. ducking out at noon, okay. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah, just I, I, I want to emphasize that's a great point that he is making because so many of our chapters do work with local media, right? Like much smaller outlets um, it, it, who could probably benefit from learning how all of this works. Um, Alicia, you're next on my list. Thank you. Um, really wonderful talk, really interesting. Um, my question has to do with, um, you sort of set up kind of a typology if you're more nervous, less nervous about when to, um, you know, kind of, put things out there into the world. And you sort of framed the most cautious option as once something's been accepted. But it seems to me that from a journal's perspective, that might be um, like the, the most violating of what they um, consider their their right to, to publish the work. And so, you know, I, I collaborate with people who, you know, work in the European context and there's just such buy-in to, to making everything open access and it's such a de rigueur part of so much of their work. And here it's it's an economic privilege. I don't have the funding to pay for open access with most of the journals that require it. And so it seems to me like, I, I want everything to be open access, but um, if I'm publishing in journals that think that they have to put something behind a paywall, won't they be unhappy if I'm putting something on a preprint as it's being accepted. It's interesting you say unhappy. They don't love you. So we don't care if they're happy. The question Will is- Will they sue us? I mean, is um, it considered right. so a violation the, so the, of the agreement? Right. So the question is, what is your author agreement? Um, yeah. And um, uh, it's quite rare that your author agreement does not allow you to share a preprint. Um, okay. um, um, and there are, there are some bad agreements. So um, one way to look at this is, say you post a preprint before you ever submit it to a journal, right? Um, so now the question is, are they willing to consider it even though it's already been, right? So it's not, so you, you don't get their permission at the beginning because they don't mm -hmm. have nothing to do with it. So will they still consider it if there's already been a preprint? Almost universally, yes. It's hard to find okay. a social science journal that will not. But the, it gets, but that, that's the easy part. But then what about if you revise it, if you send it, you get revisions, you revise it, now you wanna share the improved version. Now they're starting to get antsy because they're starting to feel like they have made a contribution to the value, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so that, that's when you start to see the, the author agreements change a little. And some will say, um, you can, sh and a common like Sage, Wiley, journals, um, their default policy is you can share the author accepted manuscript, um, that is the final approved version before copy editing, on a nonprofit repository, um, uh, a disciplinary repository. So that, that okay. you'll see that in very common language. Um, some of them um, will say, but only 12 months later or something like that. And that would be, that would be a, a, a worse agreement because you don't want, I mean, in the worst case, the revisions that you did for the journal corrected some important errors and you don't right. want to keep circulating the wrong one. 
Um, that's right. pretty uncommon, <laughs> but it might happen. Um, and so you really want to get that revised one out there. So you do want to know going into your relationship with the journal what you're going to end up with. Um, okay. So I would check that database that I listed. It's called Sherpa Romeo. Um, you can uh -huh. see the policy before you submit and see like, am I going to get into a situation here? Um, but I can tell you that we have never, thank you, um, uh, Sophia, I've never, we have not received a request from a journal yet to take down a preprint. I mean, we mm -hmm. have under digital millennium copyright, whatever that thing is called. Um, we have to take it down if we get an appropriate request and we've never received one. And we do not, um, we don't really enforce, like we tell people, I mean, you have to click a box that says you have permission to share this, but we're not checking your author agreement for you. We're right. just letting people do it. Um, if they post a journal PDF and it says like copyright Elsevier right on the front page, we reject it, um, or at least we say to them, it looks like you're sharing something you might not have permission to. They might have a license to share it. We just ask I them see. to confirm. So, okay. um, so the smart journals understand that um, preprint version circulating help them more than they hurt them. Um, okay. so, so they're not really trying to get into this fight with you. Um, okay. They, they may want to, you know, they're uh, increasingly they are. Um, so, for example, in life sciences, um, if you go to um, BioArchive, there's like 150 journals now that you can submit to the journal right from you upload your paper to BioArchive and you check a box and it submits it to plus one. So okay. the journals want this. The journals want that the preprint out there generated because the impact factor is how they measure how good they are as a journal. Um, it's based on citations in the it's first expanded. two years, right? So if they've, if, if they've got nine months of people reading and getting ready to, and then their publication citing your paper in the pipeline, they get a much bigger citation bang right that when promise. it publishes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, so it's becoming okay. much more normal to submit like that it's part of the workflow of journals that they understand as a preprint and they're having to build a business model around what they can add, the value they can add on top of that. It's, it's, That's great. it's anyway, so um, I don't want to totally, um, I don't want to blow so off that concern, but if you look, I think you'll, mostly you're fine. Okay, okay. good to know. I'll call you if I get in trouble. <laughs> Definitely, or before. I am mean, like, I'm happy yeah. to talk about it. So, yeah, no, that's great. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah. I have to hop off, but thanks so much for your presentation. Thanks for coming. Thanks for that great question, Alicia. Um, Galeen? Thank you. Um, that was part of my question that you just answered, Dr. Cohen. I'm a big fan on um, Twitter, so it's nice to hear from you in person. Um, I'm a demographer at Columbia University, and I teach a course. Um, to master's and doctoral level students on demography, but really making it sort of applied and sort of social justice oriented. And part of that is uh, research dissemination. So my question is, um, what should my advice for students be basically at this time? So they're trying to you know, get publications, they're early in their careers. And so, especially those who want sort of academic type careers. So should I be telling them to be sure to post to preprints or should I advise them? Basically, what should I, what advice should I give them in that context? It's a good, it's a good question. Um, one thing I didn't say, sorry about my focus here. One thing I didn't say is um, when you post a paper on Social Archive, you can't take it down later. <laughs> so um, uh, unless that turns out to be a legal problem, um, we don't really, we don't let you say, I decided this was bad and I wanna take it down. Um, uh, because um, we're not actually, um, we just were, we're, you know, we have a commitment to the scholarly record and it happened and it can't unring the bell. So there is an issue that I think students have to consider, which is if I post a paper and it's bad because I'm, you know, just learning how to do this, I, of course you would never say it's bad, but you know what I mean? In 10 years, you might not be that proud of it, let's just say, or that proud of that version. Um, um, so you do want to be careful about it. Um, uh, and uh, you don't want to throw up every little thing that you work on um, just because you can. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe no one really wants to read it right now anyway. Okay. So, but I do think it's important to make it um, an explicit part of the workflow. So I would say, if you're going to present it at a conference, at that point, you are prepared to make it public. Um, you should you know, barring some unforeseen situation, 
you should make that paper public. I mean, I don't think, I think if you're standing up and giving a research presentation for 15 minutes at PAA, I think there should be a paper behind you that you're willing to share. Like, I think that's just important accountability. I also think that paper should have data and code behind it. But even if it doesn't have the data and code behind it, you should be prepared to say like, you know, that graph you put up with the hundred coefficients that no one can read, like they should be able to read that on their own time. And anyway, so I think, I do think that's an important part of training and socialization to say for accountability's sake, at the point at which you're presenting it, you should do it right. Um, uh, and, and I think the same goes for submitting to a journal. Um, you don't want to submit if 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 you're if you if you think it might be bad or, or embarrassing or you're not sure if it serves your interest to share it, it's probably not ready to share with the journal peer reviewers either, but might be the most important per people in your field who are the reviewers. Um, so yeah, so I guess I, I would say uh, to identify those cut points for when to for when to do it. Um, but I definitely think um, it's an important part of the training process to, I mean, everything I've said, I would love to have everybody be trained on. <laughs> My second question, which was related to the response that you gave earlier was I've seen in a lot of author guidelines for journals. Now they're saying you're not allowed to post a, a preprint uh, at the submission stage. So do I ignore that or do I do you think that's real? Because on the like author agreement side, I understand like whatever is there, but sometimes they're like sneaking it into the author guidelines for submission. And so I'm wondering how accountable you are to that. I'd have to look at that. I mean, they, okay. should, they shouldn't have two different documents that they're putting out that disagree with each other. Um, the, the, um, it is sometimes there is a default, the publishers have a default policy like Elsevier, Wiley and Sage and individual journals may have a different policy. Um, so it could that could be what you're noticing. Um, or sometimes the journal guidelines may be out of date, but the author agreement actually is what governs. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, I definitely don't, I would not recommend just blowing off, just ignoring something like that. Um, uh, I would I would like to get it reconciled. I would, you know, I don't want anybody to get to end up getting boxed into something. Um, oh, um, I sometimes happens. Um, some some people are because of blind peer review. Some people are afraid that if there's a preprint version, the blinding will be messed up. So an editor um, or a, 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 an a, a, an associate editor, editorial assistant may Google the title, find the preprint, and say you have to take this down because it'll mess up. Um, that. Um, now, then you're in that awkward position where you don't want to annoy them and make them your enemy, but they're wrong. <laughs> so not that it won't mess up the blindness, it may mess up the blindness, but they probably don't have a policy that you actually have to take it down at that point. Um, but they just makes them uncomfortable or they're old. Um, and so they think it's wrong. Um, and so I, then, you know, it's delicate because you never want to say to them, you don't want to piss them off because at this point your career is in their hands. So that is awkward and it does happen, but I think the best way, you know, at that point you just try gently yet forcefully to explain that it's okay. Um, blinding is an issue. Um, blind peer review is um, not a sacred principle. It's a, good, it's a good idea. It has some benefits. It has some downsides. Um, so, but it is, but you know, just like having your name, having that you could have the title on a conference presentation and that messes up your blindness also. Um, uh, or, or, you know, on your CV for work in progress, you know, there's all kinds of ways that, that these things happen. Um, uh, blindness, you know, in some ways you, it, it, it would be ideal all the time, um, except it also protects bad, it protects the, the uh, anonymity protects evil doers among the reviewers. Um, and if they were being held accountable, you know, it might be, a, it might be a fair trade-off to say, <laughs> that's a different issue. But you know, we're going to identify authors, and then if people persecute them because they're from marginalized groups or they're um, less famous or important, um, then we can, you know, then we can hold those people accountable who did that. Anyway, good question, really good question. I'm also happy to discuss if you want to show things like that to me. I love those kind of investigations. Obviously, good question. Great, thanks. Think. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I was also thinking what Philip said earlier about 
the the junctures at which you're most likely to have your work stolen and if you're a graduate student uh, it's it your is mm-hmm. yeah. I'm sorry that's the most common thing I'm sorry to interrupt no, no, that's where I was going with that. Um, Diana had to, um, my fellow co-chair of the chapter had to go to another meeting, but she left me a question to ask. Um, so um, she's in public health and she says, if, it would be great if you could provide some sense of the percent of papers or participation from the public health medical science disciplines. Um, I don't know if you have a sense. Um, it's interesting. There's a little bit of a distinction between public health and medical, um, 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 because anyway, they're 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 diff- they're you know they're different. Um, I, I I can't give a percentage. Um, I know in the case of COVID nineteen papers, um, we can say it was something like thirty percent were preprints, um, but um, you know in 2020 we have that one paper. Um, but it's hard to say. And I don't, I, you know, if you look at like l- what they call life sciences, I think does not really include public health, right? Um, but what they, when they say, but med archive does take public health. Like I wrote this paper about high heel shoe injuries um, and I put that on med archive. Um, that was fine, uh, even though it wasn't you know, it wasn't medical, but it was public health. So I guess, I don't know exactly what the difference is between medical and public health. It's, it's something about the independent variable and the dependent variable, if it's a chemical, if it's a disease. No, but we do diseases. It's a good question. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, any other questions? I see Sarah just turned on her camera. Oh, yeah, sorry, Sarah, go ahead, please. Oh, hi there. Thank you. Um, This is super informative. Um, I have two logistical questions. One is the hypothesis annotation that you mentioned that you can write notes. Does that notify the author of people's (laughs) notes or is that just your own private notes? (laughs) Um, It's funny that you say that. It's a little bit of an authority point with hypothesis. Um, The author is not notified when you put a comment on their paper. Um, I really wish they were because and it's actually, I don't promote this feature that heavily because I'm not sure people want to post their papers and have comments appear that they're not notified of, <laughs> right? Like if somebody posts a whole thing about why your paper is wrong, I'd like to know right away. Um, it, people don't use it very much um, for that. So, but hypothesis is a great tool, but the interesting, and so hypothesis is is laid on top of our platform and it's a, it's a nonprofit um, uh, operation. Um, the great thing, but the thing about hypothesis is they don't, um, the owner of the document, they don't have a field in their database for author, um, basically. So they don't know who the author is of the documents. So in their database, it's, it's associated with the site that it's on. But you can use hypothesis to comment on New York Times articles um, or anything, anything on the internet. Um, and the, so, but, the, but as a user, you have the option of making the comments visible to the public visible to nobody but yourself, or you can create groups. Um, And it's a really nice thing. Um, They use it for teaching a lot. Hypothesis has been really promoting this. You can create a group of eight people and all comment all over a paper, but the public can't see the comments, but you all can. So, um, you know, we're very close to it's, um, I mean, you you could run a journal, you could run a journal on Social Archive by um, asking people to, write reviews using hypothesis. And then when you get three positive reviews, you post a link on a list of papers and you call it, this is my journal. Um, And that would be what we call an overlay journal, overlaying on top of the preprint server. And there are these in math and physics on archive. There are some journals like that where the papers are just sitting on archive and somebody puts up a list. It's sort of like, here's my list of my favorite papers. But instead of just my favorite papers, it's my favorite papers that at least you know, a certain number of people had said we're good and I've reviewed the reviews and I've decided it's good and here's my really good list of papers and it's a journal. Um, so it can be done with hypothesis. Thanks, and uh, the other logistical question is, I don't, I'm not familiar with licensing. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know if there, is there like a standard one or the most right. commonly used, yeah. Um, uh, I actually have a slide about that. Um, which I can share. Um, it's sometimes, you sometimes start losing, you know, 
people when you talk about this. Um, so I'll just, I'll be brief. Um, uh, so uh, CC0 is anybody can use it for anything, right? Um, and uh, it allows people, it, it puts no restrictions, essentially. Um, now, key thing is in academia, of course, CC, that doesn't mean that you don't have to cite it or give credit like that. Those are ethical, not legal obligations. So the ethics still apply, right? Just because it's CC zero doesn't mean I can put my name on it and submit it to a journal. That would be unethical, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, that would be plagiarism. Okay, but that's CC zero. CC by is just attribution. Anybody can share it, but they must link back. Okay, and then you get into the more restrictive. CC by, but with non-commercial, or non-derivative, that's ND, so you can't cut it up and modify it. Non-commercial is you can only use it for nonprofit purposes. And share alike means if you're gonna redistribute it, you have to redistribute it under the same conditions, the same with the same license, essentially. So we offer all of these and there are some variations on them. Um, CC BY is basically what I use for just about everything. So my blog, <coughs> um, this talk, my talks, I, I do CC BY. Um, um, you could say non-commercial, there's a little bit of a problem, you know, they're hard to enforce, obviously. Um, um, there are publishers who um, scrape up um, uh, open access articles and publish books um, and say like, here's an edited volume. There's a publisher called Apple, uh, Apple Acad Academic. A lot of the books they publish are just collections of articles that are open access articles um, and they sell them for money. Um, the trick is they don't really sell a lot of them for a lot of money. <laughs> so, and when they do, it doesn't really hurt the authors. Um, it, so it, it's offensive, it violates our norms, but it doesn't really hurt you. Um, so I don't mind. So I just use CC BY. I, would, I wouldn't say, if you said NC, then that publisher could not sell your paper. But I don't really care if they do um, because um, the open access version is still open. So it's a shame if they're fooling people into paying for something that they shouldn't be paying for. Um, but it's not, you know, but they're, they're bad people and they shouldn't do that. But it's not, you're not really like, it's not that bad. Uh, you know, it's just not like, it's not your job to stop that in a way. So I recommend CC BY, long story short. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> Any others? Great. Um, do you want to stop sharing so we can see everyone? See um, yes. Okay. Good. All right. Um, last call for questions. If not, I. Oh, um, Galen says, um, where do oh, yeah. um popula uh, population health demographers submit? You mean um, is she gone? Yeah, I think she she means okay. which of the archives. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, social archive is 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 um uh, is good for that. Um, um it, 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 the the other popular one, I guess, would be. SSRN, the Elsevier preprint server. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I don't know, there's nothing else, there's nothing specifically population health um, uh, oriented besides us. So. Great. Yeah. Anyway, good. There are no, no questions from the audience. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> so I'm a primarily qualitative researcher. Yeah. And so some of the advice uh, that you gave us, you know, is about sharing your code, sharing your data set. You know, there are a lot of conversations and qualitative, you know, methodologies about like ethics around sharing data, you know, particularly if you're working with vulnerable populations. So I wonder if you, like, can you share anything that from like qualitative folks who are really into using social archive, like how do they think about it? What questions come up that we should think of if we're qualitative? Well, I mean, if you're just sharing papers, it's not that, big an issue, right? It's more about research materials. Um, you know, there are whatever ethical issues there are with confidentiality and so on with papers, maybe you don't, there, I mean, there is the, the issue of you might want to be more cautious about when to share if you're not sure about, you know, how you're blinding things or whatever. Um, so, but, I, but as far as the data and code, the research materials, um, so there's a couple of different approaches. Um, one sort of radical approach is name people, right? And, and you may know there are people who think you should do that, like journalists do. Um, just ask people if they're willing to be named and just name them. Okay. Um, uh, not just, but 
do that. Um, um, uh, that still might be different from putting like the full transcript, right? You still might, you might name them, but still edit, but still limit what you reveal about them or something like that. So that's one approach. The other is the research materials are also your um, interview guide, your coding guide, your the other stuff that does not include the confidential data, your recruitment materials. So all that can go into the open science category. Um, and then, you know, it's much more work, but you can also then like blind your transcripts um, uh, and, and share them. Um, and there are, um, there's a, there's that archive at Syracuse that hosts tons of this stuff. I forget what it's called. And they can work with people on that. Um, I can, I forget what they're called. Um, yeah, what I actually think we should maybe do, and it's not my area, but it occurs to me that um, for accountability and transparency, um, I think we should have like, um, there should be a way for reviewers to have access to all to everything, but not the public, <laughs> right? Like, like you know, I think there should be an intermediate category where ten people can read all your notes and transcripts, um, but under an agreement that they won't share it beyond that, or something like that, instead of just the book, um, where everything's already been cut down. And I just think, you know, I'd like to see that something like that set up. I think that would be neat. Um, I would be willing to, um, uh, I, I think, that, you know, that also we do that with confidential um, quantitative data to some degree, right? You get permission, you sign an agreement, you'll keep it in certain, you know, uh, 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 in a cold room or whatever. So I think we could do that with transcripts and, um, and qualitative materials also, um, just for purposes of accountability, or also people can find other things. Um, I mean, I, I know there's a whole, um, there it is, the Qualitative Data Repository at Syracuse. Thank you, QDR. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, you know, there's the other issue with ethnographers, which is um, if just because you read my transcripts doesn't mean you can analyze my data, right? Like the data is me, I was there, it's the experience. I'm probably not representing this well, but you know what I mean? That there's no, there's no such thing as reproducibility because you couldn't, and have the interaction and the experience that I had as me at that moment. So reproducibility is not really the issue, but maybe um, something like accountability is um, where what if, yeah, you still, you still might've lied um, in, what you, in what you reported um, or something like that so, or been wrong. Great, thanks. That, that helps me think about it. But um, but yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much all we have. Thank okay. you so much for visiting great. us. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Really fun. Yeah. Uh, and thanks everyone in the audience for coming and sticking to the end. Uh, we will share the recording so you can share with colleagues. And awesome. uh, yeah. You. I just, I'll just stand here in front of this chalkboard and talk all day. So. <laughs>